Welcome to NOAA Central Library's online platform for the presentation of research and ideas in support of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's mission. Today's library seminar is titled Close Kin Genetic Methods for Estimating Census Size and Effective Population Size. The presentation is part of the National Stock Assessment Science Seminar Series, which is developed by NOAA Fisheries and organized by Kristen Blackheart from the Office of Science and Technology. Today's speaker, Robin Waples, will be introduced by Kristen. But before I hand over the mic, here are a few housekeeping items for our live audience members to improve your viewing experience. If you're having trouble with the audio or visual components of GoToWebinar, I suggest that you log out and rejoin us. This resets the software and usually resolves most technical issues. This presentation is being recorded and will be available on the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel later today. I've added the channel's link to the chat box. Our speaker shared both his slides and a copy of the article that this presentation is based on. You can download them from the handouts menu of the control panel, or if you prefer, you can click on the link in the chat box to access the article. Finally, we are very interested in your questions and we encourage you to ask them throughout the seminar, even though the speaker will not address them until the end of his presentation. All audience members are muted, so type your questions or comments in the chat box under questions located in the control panel on the right side of your screen. So with that last detail, let's get started. The mic's yours, Kristen, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Robin Waples is a senior scientist at the Northwest Fishery Science Center in Seattle, Washington. Over a very productive research career, Robin has worked at the interface of science and policy with a focus on population genetics and the application of evolutionary and ecological principles to inform conservation and management. Uh, evidencing the depth of his research contributions, Robin's works have been cited over 32,000 times, and he's been the recipient of multiple prestigious awards, including the NOAA Disti Distinguished Career Award, the William E. Ricker Fishery Conservation Award, the Molecular Ecology Prize, and an induction into the American Fisheries Society Genetics Section Hall of Excellence. In addition to this uh, voluminous research output, Robin also spends considerable time supporting the development of young scientists. A final interesting fact that I found about Robin is that Google seems to think he died nearly a thousand years ago in 1071, but remains affiliated with NOAA. So we have a distinct privilege of hearing from a pretty unique personality today. So with that, I will hand it over to Robin and thank you so much for being here with us today to share your latest research. Well, thanks very much, uh, Kristen and Lisa, for organizing this and inviting me. Um, I want to acknowledge my co-author on this paper project, Pierre Futri, uh, from Cyro and Hobart. Uh, and also a disclaimer, uh, uh, this series is about stock assessment science. I'm not a stock assessment person, uh, but I do work on some stuff that's related. So I hope this talk will be of interest to at least some of you. Um, important to talk to realize that for any population, there, there are two numbers that are really important to understand the ecological evolutionary dynamics. Uh, census size is basically the number of individuals or maybe the number of adults. Uh, captures the demographic consequences of population size, things like competition, predation, birth and death rates, migration, all of these depend primarily on the census size. And, but the evolutionary consequences of population size, things like rates of genetic drift, rate of inbreeding, rate of loss of genetic diversity, these all depend not directly on N, but on what's known as the affected population size, uh, or NE. And NE is generally less than N and can be a great deal less, uh, particularly in uh, marine species with high fecundity and high early mortality. So uh, both of these parameters are difficult to estimate. They're challenging. There's considerable methodology been built up, developed to estimate both of these, but it's occurred largely independently. 
And that's kind of a shame because they do share a lot of features. They share uh, dependency on the same basic demographic and life history data. Uh, so I think it, there's room for improved synergy in coordinating efforts to estimate both of these uh, key parameters. One important thing to realize about effective population size, all these evolutionary processes are a function inversely related to ME. So they're a function of one over ME. What this means is this relationship between effective size and these rates of evolutionary processes is very nonlinear. Uh, if you have a large NE, the one over NE is small, rate of genetic drift often is small enough to be ignored. So the real uh, interest in effective size is on the left side of this curve, where small changes in effective size can have a big difference in the rates of these uh, evolutionary processes, particularly loss of genetic diversity and things or conservation or management concern. The, uh, because of this possibility that any can be smaller than n, considerable interest in the ratio of these two. And there's a very simple demographic formula that's to a very good approximation, uh, captures the ratio of any to n, and it just uses two variables. You have a stable population, if you have K-bar is the mean and number of offspring per parent and VK is the variance, then to a very good approximation, the ratio of N to N is a simple function of the ratio of the variance to the mean. So this variance to mean ratio is primary determinant of the effective size to census size ratio. So we're gonna focus on this ratio now, close kin methods deal with parents reproducing in individual years. Most species are iteroparous and reproduce in multiple years. So instead of focusing on any per generation, which is across lifetimes, we're going to focus on what's called effective number of breeders per year, or NB. And that number then is directly analogous to the N, which is then would be the number of parents in any given year that are potential reproducers. If you consider all these parents reproducing in one year, there are two components to this variance in reproductive success. There's a among age effect. These are systematic differences in expected fecundity with age. And these are captured by the BX vector in a standard life table. There's also a within age effect. This is variation in reproductive success of individuals of the same age and sex. And I use the the symbol phi to designate this, and this is age specific, so you could have a different phi value for each age, and it captures the ratio then of variance to mean. And random reproductive success basically leads to, <clears throat> leads to a Poisson variance where uh, the ratio is just one. Now, one of the most uh, Probably widely used model in evolutionary biology is the Wright Fisher model of reproduction. And in the standard Wright Fisher model, uh, the parents of each offspring are chosen randomly and independently and with equal probability from a pool of potential parents. And that leads to a Poisson variance in offspring number. And the expected result is is effective size equals the census size. In this generalized Wright Fisher model, you still draw the parents of each offspring randomly and independently, but we allow the probabilities that each parent gets picked to be different. So these uh, probabilities then are determined by a vector of parental weights we'll call W. And it turns out that under this generalized Wright Fisher model, it's a very simple expression where there's ratio of effective, in this case, effective number of breeders per year to total number of adults in a year is this simple function of CV2 here, which this is squared coefficient of variation of these parental weights. So it's the variance in parental weights divided by the mean squared. 
So if there's no variance in the parental weight, you get the standard right fisher model because the coefficient of variation is zero. Uh, so any difference in the parental weights, uh, unequal parental weights will then reduce effective size. I like to think of effective size in terms of lottery. It's a special kind of lottery where there's a separate draw to see who gets to be the parents of each offspring. So in the standard Wright Fisher model, everybody has the same number of tickets in the lottery. So it's an equal probability of being chosen. And that leads to binomial sampling variance, which is almost the same as Poisson. So that means on average, you're gonna get a variance equal to the mean with effective size approximately equal to census size. But in most real populations, the lottery is rigged in favor of certain individuals. Some individuals are bigger, stronger, sexier, uh, whatever, and just have better chance of reproducing than others. And so these different chances then, uh, you can think of these individuals having more tickets in the lottery. And uh, it's stratifying the population into expected winners and losers. That's what increases VK relative to the Poisson expectation, and it reduces N to N. So these parental weights I, I just introduced in the last slide can be thought of as the number of tickets each individual has in the lottery. You've got more tickets in the bowl, then you're more likely to get picked each time to be a parent. So let's now look at marker capture literature. There's extensive literature on classical mark recapture covering 50 or 60 years. I'm going to just talk about a very simple cartoon version that only applies under the very simple model and all sorts of assumptions are met. But in that case, there's just, it's very easy to understand what's going on in this model, that's why I'm using it. In that case, there are just three steps in that mark recapture. First, you capture, mark, and release a certain number of individuals. You remember and write down that number. You allow them to mix thoroughly throughout the whole population. Then you collect a second random sample. You record the fraction that are marked, and these are the recoveries. And in that very simple model, then your estimate of abundance is simply the number that you mark divided by the fraction that are marked in the recoveries. So you can see that if, if you don't get many recoveries, then the denominator, the recoveries, is small and, and that is bigger. Uh, that must mean that, that the marked individuals mixed with a lot of other individuals and diluted the effect of the marks. That's the basic idea. Close King mark recapture actually can use essentially the same framework, but it differs in a couple of important respects. In this case, the genetic marks are applied naturally by the relatives who share genes, just naturally by and dealing in an inheritance. And that means you don't ever have to sample the same individual more than once. And in fact, if you're looking at siblings, you never have to sample the parents at all. So you have different relationships uh, can be treated as different kinds of marks. The two that have been used so far in applications are parent offspring pairs or POPs and siblings. Uh, and since CKMR methods only provide information about parents that produce offspring, uh, these estimates then are going to apply to adult census size. Now, the most rigorous authoritative uh, paper describing close skin mark recapture occurred and appeared in this statistical journal about uh, four or five years ago. Um, and of the three authors, uh, Hans Skog in the middle from Norway is a statistician. He dreamed up this idea about 20 years ago. But Mark Bradenton from Hobart uh, is the one who realized the potential. And about 15 years ago, he started a major effort to apply this to Southern Bluefin tuna, uh, which is a billion dollar a year industry. Uh, 
everybody was really worried about the status. Everybody agreed it was severely depressed, but nobody knew how bad off it was. So he developed the whole architecture for modern close kin mark recapture and saw that project through to uh, publication in 2016. And then Eric Anderson from our lab in Santa Cruz is a world expert in pedigree reconstruction and finding close kin with genetic methods. So a rigorous uh, close kin mark recapture analysis is generally going to involve a lot of things. It's going to be complicated because you probably have to have multiple years of sampling. You may uh, use parent offspring pairs or siblings or both. Uh, almost certainly you're gonna have to have, to have accurate aging. You have to account for multiple covariates that can affect the estimates. There's uncertainty in pedigree reconstruction and some other factors. Because of all of this complications, it's generally a case that estimation is done in a pseudo likelihood framework, similar to what they do in integrated population modeling that jointly estimates all the key parameters and formally accounts for uncertainty. And this is not unlike, as I understand it, uh, basically what uh, modern stock assessment science typically does in stock assessments. So there are definitely parallels there. The problem is these models are very uh, complicated and opaque. And even if I understood them well, I probably couldn't explain them very well to you folks. So, I'm more simplistic. I like to think in terms of high school or even middle school algebra. So we're going to talk about close kit mark recapture in terms of a very simple framework, sort of directly analogous to that cartoon version of uh, mark recapture. And there are two main uh, parameters here that we're going to deal with. There are the number of comparisons you're going to make. You're going to make a lot of comparisons in CKMR of two pairs of individuals to see if they're a close kin match, and R then is the number of matches you get from all those comparisons. The other parameter that's really important is the probability that each comparison is going to produce a match. And it's intuitive that this is going to be inversely related to population size, because in large populations, uh, relatives are going to be rare. So you aren't going to find very many, so that probability is going to be small. In small populations, everybody tends to be closely related, so you expect to have more matches. So if you know the probability of a match and you know how many comparisons you made uh, to find close kin, then you can uh, estimate the expected number of recoveries, which is given by this equation on the right here. Uh, and the Approximately equal sign there is reflects the fact that these comparisons are not strictly independent. But with large populations and a sparse sampling, the approximation is good enough in general that you can usually ignore those dependencies. And that's what I'm going to do here. So from this equation on the right, just a simple rearrangement, you have an estimator of abundance. That's a simple function of the ratio of the number of comparisons to the number of matches, very similar to classical mark recapture, where the number of recoveries is in the denominator. Now let's compare this with uh, how the formulation for a method for estimating effective size based on siblings. This is by Jin Liang Wang, 2009, widely used method, it considers three types of relationships in this single generation pedigree. Uh, either each pair of individuals gets put in a bin, and they're either considered to be full siblings, half siblings, or unrelated. And he developed some equations that showed here that HS and 2FS, those are fractions of the comparisons that fall in those bins. Uh, half siblings in this case are both uh, combined maternal half siblings and paternal half siblings. Uh, he uh, developed this simple relationship to effective size, so the fraction of these siblings and rearranging that 
you get this equation in the middle, which has, these are the recoveries in the denominator. These are the matches of close kin from all the comparisons you do. Now those are fractions of matches. So when you convert those to actual number of comparisons, uh, Wang's equation converts to the one on the right, which is essentially identical in form to the, the framework for estimating abundance with closed kin mark recapture. Well, now we've got CKMR estimating N using siblings or POPs and Wang estimating NE using siblings. How does that work? Uh, so I wondered about that when we started this project and we're going to see how you can uh, sort out that issue. Uh, and also when you have overlapping generations, as most people have, Wang's method really is intended to apply to single cohorts. So you're dealing with offspring from a single cohort, and then it provides estimates about effective number of breeders or NB. So let's look at how close kin market capture accounts for factors that can affect this probability of a match. The, the, the general way it does this is by using the concept of expected relative reproductive output or ERRO. So it's relative, expected relative reproductive output of a given individual I is just its expected reproductive output, expected number of offspring produced divided by the total expected reproductive output of the population in that time period and that's designated by TRO. So these are standardized then so that the sum of these ERROs across the population sum to one. And it turns out then that ERRO is identical to the standardized vector of parental weights W that I just described earlier that is an important determinant of effective population size. So that's an interesting, strong parallel between the two types of methods. And furthermore, this TRO, I believe, a stock assessment biologist can come in, uh, but uh, stock assessment biologists are generally interested in something called spawning stock biomass. Uh, I believe TRO is probably proportional to SSB or something like that. So it might be useful to have some stock assessment geeks uh, comment about that. What are some of the covariates that affect uh, ERO and hence the probability of a match? So these are the things that you have to worry about in any application. For POPs, um, it turns out that for the simple reason that every offspring has exactly two parents, your expected number of recoveries or matches does not depend on the variance in reproductive output among the parents. Uh, it does, however, it only, it only depends on that variance on one situation where some factors, the same factors that affect ERO for individuals also affect their probability of being sampled. And I'll see an example of that coming up. For siblings, there's three things that are always important to consider. First, you always have to consider mortality between uh, event between cohorts. You always have to worry about whether fecundity changes with age. And you always have to worry about correlations in individual reproductive success over time. So we'll look at some of those in siblings then. From that statistical science paper, the probability that a random pair of offspring that you're going to compare are siblings. In this case, we're looking at the probability that they share a mother, so they're maternal, have sibling pairs. Um, they're given by this. Uh, formula here, which is the summation of a product. And each term in the product is the expected relative 
reproductive output of individual I at time one, and it's ERO at time two. And the summation is across all the mature females that were live at time one. So that's how you calculate the probability of a random pair of offspring that are going to produce a match, a half sibling match. So uh, the ERRO for those females that are live at time one, but if you're interested in its ERRO at time two, that has to be discounted by the possibility it will die before reaching time two in which case it's ERRO is zero. So to do that, you have to know probability of mortality. It also, in time two, you also have to adjust for any changes in fecundity with age because an individual's older in time two than time one, and if it's uh, fecundity has changed with age, that's gonna affect the product of these ERROs. Now, since this, probability of a match is a summation of a product, it's gonna involve a covariance term. That's the covariance of reproductive excess in the two time periods. And you can write, this is an identical way of writing that equation I just showed you. And uh, so we're gonna look at uh, this covariance term actually provides some insights into factors that will affect the probability of a close kin match actually probability of a sibling match. <laughs> so there are two general cases we want to consider. Uh, first case is the offspring are from the same cohort. That means T1 equals T2. There's really just one time period. Well, if there's one time period, then there's just one RRO you're dealing with. And the covariance of a random variable with itself is the variance of that variable. So in the case of a single cohort, where you're comparing individuals in the same cohort, the probability of getting a sibling match is a function of number of parents, that's the one over and a half number of females, but it's also a function of the variance in reproductive output among the parents. And that variance is a signal for effective size. So, you can't use same cohort siblings to estimate N unless you know all the information to decompose the effects of effective size. <clears throat> and that's good because Wang's Simshit method is based on the premise that with single cohort siblings, you're getting a signal for effective size. The other case is the siblings are, or, or the individuals are from different cohorts. So this case, time two is after time one. And there, and now there's three subcases here. First, if the covariance across time is zero and you could ignore it, then what you're left is that the probability of a sibling match is this simple function of the mean relative reproductive output at time two. So it's giving you information about abundance in time two with no within cohort effect of variance. So this show demonstrates why you can only use cross cohort siblings to estimate N. Um, if the covariance is not zero and is positive, that suggests that the same individuals tend to be quote, above the average, say, reproducing in multiple time periods. That be, could be because, for example, with, uh, with cold-blooded species like fish, they have often indeterminate growth. It's usually the case that fecundity depends more on size directly than age. And so if an individual is big for its age at time one, it's probably gonna be big for its age at time two. So that would set up these positive covariances. That's gonna increase the probability of uh, sibling matched. It's gonna produce more, more matches than you would expect under a zero covariance. So that's gonna affect your estimate of N unless you account for it. Another way these covariances could be non-zero is if you have skip breeding where uh, whether uh, nibbles is going to breed in, in a time period two depends on whether it bred or not in a previous time period. 
And so that could be either positive or negative. Uh, and so it could affect the probability of a match in complex weights. We can illustrate that with uh, this figure from, from the paper. Uh, in this simple example, which is rather extreme, every uh, many species, it's, it's the case that you have non-breeders and breeders every year. In this simple example, all the breeders become non-breeders the next year, and then they go back to breeders the following year. <clears throat> with just a trickle of individuals that reproduce in the subsequent years. So what this means is if you're going to compare offspring from different cohorts for siblings, if you sample is in scenario A where they're one cohort apart, there are essentially no parents that breed in two consecutive years. So you're going to be hard pressed to find any siblings comparing individuals born one year apart or three or five years apart. But if you compare offspring that are two cohorts apart, then you're going to find a lot of siblings, but their estimate of abundance is going to be related not to the total adult population size, but just to the number of breeders that produce, reproduce in a, any given year. So you can get either positive or negative biases. Uh, depending on the circumstances, assuming your goal is to estimate abundance of the total adult population. Okay, so we talked quite a bit about bias. Let's talk a bit about precision. The other factor, because even if a method is unbiased, if it has really low precision, it may not be very useful in practical applications. Now, in traditional market capture, the precision depends on the number of recoveries. That's the value in the denominator, and that's also true in <clears throat> CKMR. Now, in that statistical science paper, they developed a rule of thumb <clears throat> that, which assumes a Poisson variance in the number of offspring. That if, for example, you decide you want a CV coefficient of variation of your estimate of about 15%. That was their target in the uh, Southern Bluefin tuna study. And they actually came very close to achieving it. It turns out you need about 50 close kin matches to produce that. So uh, we, we wanted to uh, evaluate this. And um, so this, this graph, illustrates this principle for a scenario where the total abundance is a little over 3,000. We've created enough comparisons of individuals uh, given the life history of the population to produce an expected number of 50 half-sibling pairs across the, across the experiment. So these triangles describe the functional relationship between uh, the number of recoveries R and your estimate of abundance. So in this case, so if you actually get the 50, let's see, where are the, if you actually get the 50 uh, recoveries and you actually have a Poisson variance to R, then, uh, the variance to R is 50 also. I mean, the standard deviation is about seven. Your confidence intervals are about plus or minus 15 or so. That's in the dashed line, which shows the Poisson variance to your number of recoveries. And if you then follow the consequences of that for this functional relationship, you would get a sort of 95% confidence intervals, sort of 2,400 to 4,240 sort of centered on, on the right value. Um, but you can see if the true variance in R is bigger than the Poisson, then your estimates are going to be less certain and have wider confidence interval. And furthermore, if, you're, if you don't sample very intensively and say only get 20 or, 20 or 30, say, recoveries, 
you can see then you'd be dealing with the very steep part of this nonlinear curve where small differences in the number of recoveries make a big difference for your estimate. That's an indication of low precision. So what you want is really to be, you want to have a robust enough experimental design so that you end up with uh, be out, out here on the right side of this curve where the curve flattens out and some small changes in the actual number of recoveries or half siblings you find either due to random sampling error or, or some errors in pedigree reconstruction. Those errors don't have too big an effect on your estimate. That's the goal. So to evaluate performance both for precision and bias we did some uh, simulations using this program that's just appeared by Eric Anderson uh, that allows you to uh, simulate uh, complex life histories, keep track of the pedigrees, and do all those CKMR calculations. So I use sort of a generic life table that's shown on the right here. Individual, uh, this model species has 10-year lifespan, matures at age three, Cohort size in the men in most of the scenarios was 1,000 for each sex. We're just looking at females here. So age one, they start off with 1,000 individuals. They have 70% survival each year, so you can see the number in each age class declines. But kind of is either constant with age or proportional to age. Uh, fee, this variance of um, Offspring number of individuals same age and sex is either one, which is the random uh, Poisson Wright Fisher model, or 10, where the variance is 10 times the mean. So in this case, in the true adult sense of size across both sexes, it's a little over 3,000. This slide shows results for simulations where we use parent offspring pairs. Uh, scenario A is this base case scenario, and the solid lines show the median for these different scenarios. And you can see uh, for the first three scenarios, the median is essentially right at the target expected value, the true value. And the uh, dashed and dotted lines show the 95, 90, 95% uh, empirical CIs. So you can see that uh, under the simple model, the estimates were just as expected. The, um, I should say the solid line shows the median for the unadjusted raw estimates that don't try to do any simple calculation. They just assume that the probability of a match is one over N, one over the number of females. So scenario B has V equals 10. So you can see that it did not affect the mean estimate, but it did affect the variance. So when you have higher variance among females, it doesn't bias your estimate of abundance, but it increases the uncertainty. Increasing fecundity, scenario C and D, if you still have random sampling of adults, has essentially no effect on your estimate. But if you have selective sampling, so increasing fecundity, older individuals are more likely to produce offspring, size selective sampling, that occurs in many fisheries. They are also more likely to be captured. If you have this positive correlation of selectivity and fecundity, then you get a bias unless you've adjusted for it. Those stars show the adjusted estimates based on what we knew was the actual selectivity. And you can see all the adjusted estimates come out essentially the same as the expected. The final one there, juvenile sampling, is a situation where we sampled not only adults, we're looking, comparing juvenile offspring with only adults and the other ones. But in this case, the potential adults included juveniles, random samples of the whole population. So in this case, the fraction of comparisons uh, is that produce hits is reduced because you do a lot of comparisons with juveniles who can't produce any offspring. This makes the population look big and it's, it resulted in a big upward bias in the estimate, assuming you wanted to estimate adult population size. 
If you wanted to estimate the whole population size, then that would not be applied. Here's kind of a complicated graph, but it shows the results for precision in sibling analyses. <clears throat> in this case, we've sampled in five consecutive years and targeted to produce uh, 50 total HSPs. Uh, and this top graph shows the annual sample size you need to accomplish to expect to get 50 total HSPs over a five-year study as a function of adult N. You can see adult N here varies over about four orders of magnitude from less than a thousand to uh, well over a mil to several million. So you can see the sampling requirements are pretty modest unless population size is pretty large. But if you want to get a precise estimate for a large population, you have to devote substantial uh, time and effort to your sampling. The good news is, though, that in proportional terms for larger populations, you only have to sample a smaller fraction of the population to get the same precision. So by the time you're out here at 10 to the fifth or 10 to the sixth for abundance, you're only having to sample a small fraction of the population each year. Uh, panel C uh, looks at the coefficient of variation of uh, your estimate. And remember, uh, the rule of thumb said it should be about 15% if you get 50 total HSPs. And that was pretty much the case regardless of total abundance when phi was equal to one. That was the right Fisher model. But with phi equals 10, where you have overdispersed variance considerably among individuals of the same age and sex, you have considerably higher uh, variance, higher coefficient of variation of your abundance estimates when population size is small. As population size gets larger uh, with your sparser sampling, uh, it has the effect of sort of uh, shrinking this variance uh, toward the Poisson. So the rule of thumb from the statistical science paper uh, about Poisson variance is increasingly uh, robust for large populations. Uh, it's increasingly robust to overdispersed variants in uh, young individuals. <clears throat> the final panel shows uh, cost. Uh, this is just one one way to get the cost, but it was developed by folks in Hobart. They had quite a bit of experience with groups that do this, uh, and this cost covered genotyping and SNP discovery at a level. That should produce around 1,500 or so uh, usable and uh, highly reliable SNPs. And that, uh, most people's experience has been that's about enough for a few thousand SNPs is enough to get reliable separation of uh, uh, siblings, half siblings, and full siblings. Um, here, it's of interest now to compare relative precision. When you're using siblings, you can use these to estimate both N and NB. Uh, and uh, so in this panel, the dark lines are for estimating N. Those are cross cohort comparisons. The gray lines are for estimating NB with Wang's method. Those are within core comparisons. And it shows how this coefficient of variation in your estimate varies as a function of the number of years of data you have. This is two, three, or four, or five consecutive years of samples. And also, we looked at both the scenarios where phi equals one, that's everybody has equally probable to produce an offspring, and phi equals 10, greatly over dispersed variance. So if you look at the two middle curves for vehicles, one that dotted in dash lines, you can see that with just two years of data, the estimate of NB is slightly more precise than the estimate of the N. But as you have, once you have four or five years of data, the estimate of N is more precise. And why that occurs, why these slopes of these curves are steeper for abundance, I'll explain in just a minute. 
But look at the difference, what happens when you increase feed to 10 with over-dispersed variants of reproductive success. That, that's uh, estimating N, that's the dark black line. The variance, this uncertainty, this coefficient of variation of N and N goes way up. And um, so that considerably increases your uncertainty in your estimate. Conversely, when you're estimating effective size, if uh, a vehicle's 10, that gracefully reduces the effective size. The drift signal becomes very strong and it's much easier to detect. So the coefficient of variation with V equals 10 for estimating NB actually goes down greatly. So you have these dramatically different effects on precision with uh, over dispersed variance, the relative precision in these two methods. So this figure should illustrate why you get this increasing relative performance of estimating N uh, compared to NB as you get more and more consecutive cohorts. Uh, so for estimating N, NB, you're restricted to comparing individuals in the same cohort. Those are the black half uh, triangles there, uh, one black triangle for each cohort. But the cross cohort comparisons then, uh, and they go up linearly with the number of cohorts, the, the data points you can for estimating NB. But the number of cross cohort comparisons possible to estimate N goes up with the square of the number of cohorts. And even though you have to discount them by uh, mortality between uh, cohorts, that's the gray shading, and you still will end up with more uh, comparisons, total comparisons for the estimating N using CKMR fairly quickly in a long-term study. But as we saw, the comparisons aren't necessarily equal. You also have to consider the relative ratio of effective size to census size. So the lower the ratio of effective size to census size is, the more effective sort of each pairwise comparison is for estimating N and NB. Okay, I'm, I'm going to summarize then. I uh, have to uh, acknowledge that uh, we've just really scratched the surface. Both of these are really complicated topics. Um, so I've ignored a lot of things. You can look, find more details in the paper or other places. But there are a few uh, important take home messages here. The first is that uh, close kin marker capture and any estimation. They both depend on the same genetic and demographic data, but they're affected differently by the covariates, uh, mortality changes in fecundity with age, over dispersed variance and reproductive status, also skewed sex ratio. As we saw, these can bias closed kin marker capture unless they're properly accounted for. But these factors are the signal that effective size estimation depends on, so they're not a problem at all for estimating effective size. And in fact, to the extent they occur, they generally will increase precision for any estimation. The other thing about CKMR I didn't have time to talk about, but um, with proper type of data, um, a CKMR framework done in this integrated uh, population modeling sort of the pseudo likelihood framework, it will generally be able to estimate the key covariates from the data themselves. So if you put this all in a framework, uh, it, you, you can jointly estimate it all, all and get information about the key covariates that you need. <clears throat> uh, in most cases, accurate aging generally is gonna be really important for both of these to sort individuals into cohort to figure out how many years separate cohorts and to make sure you properly compare parents and offspring. The other thing is that um, it should be obvious that there are lots of opportunities to maximize synergies by jointly estimating N with closed kin mark recapture and N, E, or N, B with genetic methods. Uh, so, um, and with modern molecular methods, able to generate the data to reconstruct pedigrees reliably, uh, it's certainly feasible to, um, to do this jointly. So my hope is that people will pay more attention 
to these potential synergies. Uh, anytime you have a big CKMR study, you could use the same data to estimate effective size, for example. Um, so we hope that happens more in the future. So that's uh, that's the presentation for today. A couple of important acknowledgements. Uh, so I spent two months in uh, Hobart a few years ago, pre-COVID, uh, sponsored by a fellowship from CSIRO and a fellowship from NIMS, from the International Science uh, Fellowship from Office of Science and Technology. Uh, and Peter Grew really facilitated my stay in Hobart. And Mark and Eric, as you've heard, uh, play important roles in this whole enterprise. So thanks very much. I, I think uh, Lisa is monitoring the questions. I'm happy to try to answer any that have come up. Excellent. Thank you so much, Robin. Um, just as a reminder to our audience, we have about nine minutes to answer your questions. So please type them into the questions chat box and I'll read them to Robin. And uh, before we start with the questions, I also want to remind you that this is a perfect time to download Robin's slides as well as a copy of his article. Um, again, those are in the, the um, in the toolbox and that's under handouts. Um, and before I, there's a couple of questions here, but I did want to clarify one of um, the members of our audience answered your question midway and said, we use TRO as proportional to SSB for management for SBT. Hopefully. Uh, was that a, sorry, was that a question or a statement? No, that was a statement. Uh, that was okay. a response earlier to, uh, uh, yeah. to, to stock assessment scientists. Okay, good. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, so this uh, first question says, interesting talk, thank you. What biases are possible in a scenario with a long-lived species undergoing declining fecundity and corresponding shift in age structure? Would uncertainty and or bias in distinguishing juveniles versus breeding adults affect this? Okay, so you've got a uh, long-lived species with uh, Sorry, but was it declining fecundity with age or declining fecundity with time? Right. It says uh, a scenario with a long-lived species undergoing declining fecundity and corresponding shift in age structure. And okay. would yeah, and would uncertainty and or bias in distinguishing juveniles versus breeding adults affect this? Okay, yeah, that's kind of a complicated scenario. So declining fecundity, um, over time, I guess is what that means. And maybe generally across all ages, just because productivity is going down or something. Uh, if the age structure is also shifting, that would suggest mortality rate is changing. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, well, I think this is why uh, these sort of analyses are best done in this sort of integrated population modeling type framework, uh, because my understanding is that in theory, it is possible to estimate, you're going to have to estimate how the, there certainly are, I would think, lots of potential for biases in the resulting estimates if these uh, declines and changes are not properly estimated and accounted for. So assuming you have to estimate these declines from the data themselves, a lot of the, uh, and having to estimate that's going to increase the uncertainty. Uh, so I guess, I guess in theory, my understanding of these models is it would in theory be possible to get an unbiased estimate of all of these things. And you might also be able to uh, estimate the rate of decline of fecundity and the rate of change in age structure, which probably involves estimating change in mortality rate over time. Uh, but I would expect the amount of data you would need to have a good handle on that would be really pretty substantial. And the last part of the question, I think, involved separating offspring and parents. If you, uh, in parent offspring pairs, that's important because like I showed in the one case, if you're comparing 
potential offspring with potential parents that could not have produced offspring is going to increase your numerator, the number of comparisons, without any possibility of increasing your denominator, which is the number of matches. And that'll uh, produce bias. So by, if you're doing siblings only, then you don't have this worry about um, sorting the groups into potential parents and potential offspring. But you have a different worry of making sure you've got your individuals sorted in the different cohorts accurately. All right, thank so, you very much. Um, uh, we do have another question here, and this question asks, are you aware of any efforts to build the CKMR procedure into a generalized integrated analysis model? Such a possibility was discussed at a workshop in New Zealand two years ago. Yeah, so the person to ask about that is Mark Bramington. Um, so he's done uh, by far the most work, but he's worked with colleagues all over the world. He's got, I don't know, maybe five or 10 project and critical projects going on at any given time. Um, he has done uh, sort of week long workshops on this. And my understanding, I've been actually, Mark was a co author of this paper for a long time. We spent many, many, many hours discussing all this stuff. In general, we uh, we agree on all the major conclusions and details, but in the end, we could not agree about presentation. So Mark agreed to drop off as author, and we both agreed that the next paper has to be by Mark Braventon that described in more detail uh, this exactly how this whole integrated sort of likelihood framework will work. He says it's it's actually done in the in the form of sort of a course uh, that he's developed. So I guess that at the present time, I think that's the best um, the best someone could find. Uh, but check with Mark. He's on long service leave now, and it might be hard to get a hold of him. But um, he's really the person. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, it looks like that might have been our last question. Um, so I, I really appreciate your presentation today. And uh, Kristen uh, Blackheart, thank you for organizing this uh, National Stock Assessment Science Seminar Series. Um, audience, one more time, I encourage you to share the recording of this webinar with interested colleagues. I'm going to upload it to the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel in a couple of hours after we end this presentation today. Um, I'm glad you joined us for today's library seminar. NOAA Central Library is very proud to present the work of the NOAA community and its partners, and we hope you'll join us again for a National Stock Assessment Science webinar, which we host every first Thursday of the month at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So thanks again, Robin, and everyone else. Enjoy your day. Thank you.